We should allow regulators. Order, Senator Bragg, being 2 p.m., will inter interrupt for question time. Senator Cormann. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I was about to announce a ministerial absence, uh, but I see that my friend and colleague, uh, Minister Payne, is uh, able to make it. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for, for the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister explain on what legal basis former Minister Mackenzie undertook an approval role in the Community Sport Infrastructure Grant Program? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for her question. Um, uh, this matter is a matter that was raised in the Auditor General's report. He raised the question of legality of uh, the ministerial uh, approval for um, decision making. Uh, and uh, as the Prime Minister noted uh, last Sunday, having consulted with the AGS in the preparation of this advice, he the Attorney-General considers that the Auditor-General's Auditor assumption arising out of his apparent interpretation of Section 11 of the Australian Sports Commission Act is, as he notes with respect, not correct. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. The scathing independent Auditor-General's report states, and I quote, there are no records order. evidencing— or, Order. I, I do, I've got a sense I need to be able to hear the specifics of this question. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wong. The scathing order, independent Auditor-General's report states there are no re records evidencing that the minister was advised of the legal basis on which the minister could undertake an approval role, and it is not evident to the ANAO what the legal authority was. On what legal basis did Minister Mackenzie override the recommendation of Sports Australia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the supplementary question. I refer to my previous answer. Senator, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Has this minister or his office been advised at any stage by Sport Australia as to the legal basis of his predecessor's funding decisions. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for the question. Um, uh, the Prime Minister sought advice from the Attorney General. Or, or Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr. President, direct relevance. The question is about the advice to this minister. It is not about advice to the Prime Minister, and I, I accept. Uh, that there, there, was, there, is, uh, there are broader issues, but I am not canvassing those. I am asking what advice this minister got. Uh, I take the point. It was a specific question. I am going to let the minister complete a sentence or two before I uh, rule on direct relevance. I don't think he got through one then. I will call the minister to continue. Th thank you, Mr President. Um, given the um, interest in this issue, the Prime Minister, on behalf of the government, asked the Attorney-General for advice, uh, which I've just provided to the Chamber. Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance. The question is not about the Prime Minister's request to the Attorney-General. The question is very direct to this minister in his portfolio responsibilities, what advice he received from a portfolio agency. Senator Colbeck, have you completed your answer? He's completed his answer. Um, I allowed Senator Wong to continue with the point of order. Um, because I wasn't sure of that. I'll call order on my left. I called for order during a question. Order. I, I, I urge senators to be careful about the words they use if they're addressing other senators. I didn't catch that as a reflection on a senator, but we don't want to get too close. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I actually have a public interest and policy question to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Order. Can the minister update the Senate? Order. It's interesting Labor's not interested in Order. those type of questions, but my I'm... question is, can the minister update the Senate on the precautions and steps the Morrison government is taking to keep Australians safe in the wake of the coronavirus health emergency? The minister representing the Minister for Health Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz for the opportunity to provide an update on the coronavirus and the Australian protective and precautionary response. 
Uh, Mr President, as a government, our priority at this time is to protect Australians, to protect their health and to keep them safe. The government is taking action to ensure that we assist Australians whilst keeping our community safe. We took early and decisive action, which was based on the latest and best medical advice. We have mobilised the National Incident Centre. We have activated the National Medical Stockpile to provide protective masks to GPs and to frontline workers. The National Trauma Centre has been mobilised, and we are providing OSMAD assistance to those who have returned on the chartered flight out of Wuhan and are now on Christmas Island. As of this morning, there have been 28,261 confirmed cases of the coronavirus worldwide, and sadly, we have seen 565 people lose their lives as a result of the virus or its complications. Australia has 14 confirmed cases two in South Australia, four in Queensland, four in Victoria and four in New South Wales. Other suspected cases are being tested and kept in isolation. We have seen promising signs of three Australians who have had the virus being cleared and discharged after significant testing. It is encouraging and important that patients are clearing the virus and being discharged. This is a significant milestone. The government will continue to keep the Australian people updated about this matter and how we are working to protect them. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that extensive answer and ask what actions has the government taken to ensure this level of preparedness? Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Our response has been through uh, and with prompt border isolation, surveillance and contact tracing mechanisms already in place. We have acted early to provide Australia the best protection possible from this virus. Minister Hunt convened meetings of all health ministers and their chief officers on 25 January and 2 February 2020, and on 1 February the Prime Minister announced strict new travel restrictions on the advice of the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. On 30 January, the World Health Organisation declared the 2019 coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. In response to this declaration, the Chief Medical Officer was able to advise that Australia was already carrying out the activities recommended by the WHO with border isolation surveillance and contact border tracing mechanisms already in place. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. As a committed federalist, I ask what further steps is the government taking to work with state governments to ensure the most effective response possible to combat this virus? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. All state and territory governments are involved in the response with daily meetings of Commonwealth and state and territory officials. The Australian Health Protection Principal Committee is meeting daily to provide expert medical advice to government, which is assisting in informing Australia's response. This membership includes all federal, state and territory chief medical officers. A humanitarian flight which has, been success which has successfully brought people to quarantine and the upgrading of our quarantining arrangements. We thank all of those who have led this at the medical level. We thank the Chinese government for its cooperation and for those across the chamber and in state governments who are helping provide information, assistance and reassurance to Australians at this time. Our message to the Australian people is we are prepared, we are acting and we will get through this. We will continue to act on the latest and best medical advice. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister uh, for Youth and Sport, Senator Cole Beck. Um, has the Minister seen any spreadsheet listing funding applications under the Community Sports Infrastructure Program that are colour-coded and focusing on applications from marginal electorates held by the Coalition as well as electorates to be targeted by the coalition. Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yes, I've seen some public um, documents that have been demonstrated by uh, put in partially into the for, in public forum by the ABC, 
Uh, I've, I'm aware of a number of other documents that um, have been utilised in the assessment of this process, uh, but I've not spent time looking at them all. I haven't, spe I haven't, I haven't seen uh, specifically. Uh, I haven't seen specifically, uh, and as I said yesterday, I can't verify the document that um, that uh, has been partially re released by the ABC because uh, I, I actually don't have access to it. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Independent Auditor General's report states that, and I quote, records examined by the ANAO evidence that the Minister's Office used the spreadsheets provided to it by Sport Australia with additional analysis on marginal electorates held by the Coalition, as well as those electorates not held by the co Coalition that were to be targeted in the uh, 2019 election. Has the Minister seen the analysis undertaken by the former Minister's Office? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Farrell for the question. No, I haven't seen that analysis. Senator Farrell. Uh, I have a further question. Uh, thank you, President. Has the minister at any point been briefed by his agencies about concerns with the former minister's handling of the community sport infrastructure program? If yes, when and by whom was he first briefed? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, and thank, uh, thanks, sorry, Mr. President. Uh, and thanks, Senator Farrell, for the question. Um, when I came to the portfolio, uh, this program was in the delivery phase. All of the allocation of projects uh, had been completed, uh, and so my concern through the through the process of uh, this particular program has been to ensure the delivery of grants that had been allocated and uh, signed off, and of course then progress through order, the system. Senator Wong, Mr. President, on a point of order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance, and perhaps the minister will get there. But this is the second time he's been asked directly about matters within his portfolio. We are asking not about uh, uh, other matters. We are asking whether he was briefed by agencies in his portfolio expressing concern about the former minister's handling of this program. I will allow you to restate uh, the question, Senator Wong. Um, the minister has been speaking for 30 seconds um, and he's heard you remind him of it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you. And Thanks, Senator Wong, for the, for the point of order. Um, my next line was going to be, Mr President, uh, that my first awareness of the issues that were raised uh, with, by the ANAO report was when I received the ANAO report in the normal course of government receiving the report. Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Sorry, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. The human cost and the environmental cost of the fires is immense. The economic cost is over $100 billion. Australia's largest coal companies earned over $50 billion in the last five years, and they paid no income tax. When is this government going to levy coal companies to pay for disaster prevention and cleanup, including doubling the numbers of our paid firefighters, so that the polluters who are causing this problem help pay to fix it? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Under our tax system, companies uh, pay a tax uh, on their profits. And, uh, of course, uh, the uh, tax uh, law, our tax laws uh, do not uh, discriminate between uh, individual uh, companies on any basis other than how much profit they generate in a particular year. And of course, uh, as you would be aware, uh, in Australia, under our laws, uh, any company with a turnover of up to $50 million uh, will uh, eventually uh, pay 25 per cent uh, tax on their profits, uh, and any company uh, with profits or with turnover above $50 million will pay 30 per cent uh, tax on their, on their profits. And I mean, that is that is the way our tax system operates. What I would also just uh, point out again is that, uh, is that uh, what I also would just point out again is that the production and export of Australian coal uh, into uh, markets around the world where there is uh, demand for coal helps reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. Because to the extent that we, uh, to the extent that we do not supply uh, Australian coal with lower uh, 
with lower moisture content, lower ash content and higher energy intensity. It would be replaced Oder. by coal from other sources, which is more polluting. Uh, and I mean, any, anyone who has got a, a basic understanding of logic understands that if you, if you replace a comparatively more environmentally efficient energy source with a comparatively more polluting energy source, uh, the overall effect of that uh, is going to be bad for the order. environment. Order. Senator Waters on a point of order. Yeah, thanks, President. Just a point of order. The question went to whether this government will make the polluters pay to clean up the costs of the disaster uh, they are uh, causing. Uh, Double our firefighters. Uh, I'm yet to hear the minister address Senator Waters, that. as I remind senators, um, a minister is entitled to respond to part of a question. The question contained a lengthy preamble with a number of assertions. The minister can be directly relevant by responding to any, all or part of a question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. As I've uh, indicated, uh, in Australia, companies pay tax on their profits, uh, and you know, that is uh, you know, obviously appropriate. Um, and um, you know, uh, I've, I think I've addressed the other parts of the question. Um, you know, obviously, I can also assure Senator, I can assure, uh, Senator Waters uh, that this government does not have any plans whatsoever to reintroduce a Labor Green carbon tax because we understand it would harm the economy, it would harm the environment, Order. and it would Senator leave Australia Cormann, worse off. Time for the answers expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Today, coal company Adani was criminally convicted for false and misleading information about unlawful land clearing. They do have a track record of non-compliance with environmental conditions. Given that former Fire Chief Greg Mullins has said that burning coal is the base cause of the severity of these bushfires, will the government now use its legal power to cancel Adani's mine approval on the basis of this criminal conviction? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I'm sure uh, Senator Waters would be aware, uh, the uh, uh, project, the Carmichael Mine project, uh, has been thoroughly assessed and reviewed uh, both by federal and state authorities in Queensland. Uh, it uh, uh, is being supported and has obtained and secured all of the relevant approvals. Um, it's been supported both by the federal government and by the state Labor government in Queensland. Uh, it, will, it will not only help create jobs. Uh, in Queensland. It will also help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions because it will uh, displace more polluting coal uh, in, uh, that would be coming from other sources. Australian coal helps to reduce emissions when it displaces more polluting coal from other sources and I would have thought the Greens should come on board and support that um, uh, effort to help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks very much, President. The government accepted half a million dollars in fossil fuel donations in an election year, the most recent election year. Half of Order. that was from Adani, some of which was, denoted, uh, was donated prior to groundwater approvals being issued, and some of which was donated after those groundwater approvals were issued. Given the climate crisis that we are in, when will you give the money back? Senator Cormann. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. So, Senator Waters asked me about donations, and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that the biggest, the single biggest corporate donation ever in the history of the Commonwealth. Where, where, where did that go to? Did I go to the Labour Party? No. Did I go to the Liberal Party? No. Did it go to the National Party? No. Did it go to One Nation? No. It went to the Australian Greens. Oh, 1.6 million dollars to the Australian Greens. You are absolute hypocrites. Order. Order. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to Senator Mackenzie's statements to the media on Monday and to the Senate to the Senate last night, in which she said, and I quote, I do not accept that those memberships were in conflict were a conflict of interest. And I do not believe the gifted membership of the Australian Clay Target Association or my paid membership to Field and Game Australia contribute any real or apparent conflict of interest. If Senator Mackenzie is correct, why did she have to resign? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I think these issues have been uh, canvassed, uh, obviously, over the weekend. Uh, as you would be aware, the Prime Minister asked the Secretary of his Department uh, to conduct uh, a review uh, into relevant matters, and uh, at the end of that uh, process, uh, based on uh, an 
undisclosed conflict of interest, which uh, it was found to be in breach of uh, ministerial standards, uh, Senator McKenzie offered her resignation. I mean, that's a matter of public record. Now, having said that, I mean, Senator McKenzie did an outstanding job as uh, Minister for Sports, and indeed the uh, programme uh, that she developed was uh, very popular and very successful. And through Senator McKenzie's interventions, uh, exercising appropriately exercising her ministerial discretion, she actually ensured that a higher proportion of electorates uh, represented by Labour members would get project funding. And, and, and of course, uh, because, because under the independent recommendations of Sports Australia, only 26 per cent of uh, the electorates uh, with project funding were, were, were Labour electorates. And of course, uh, and of course, and of course uh, through Senator McKenzie's intervention, well, I've, I've actually answered the question. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Only days after Senator Mackenzie resigned her ministry as de and as deputy leader of the Nationals because of her role in the corrupt sports rort scheme, Deputy Prime Minister McCormick has said he looks forward to her, and I quote, coming back later on down the track. Does the Prime Minister also support Senator Mackenzie's return? Senator Cormann. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Well, yes, of course. Of, I mean, of course, we agree with um, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister that, uh, you know, in due course down the track, we would uh, welcome uh, Senator McKenzie back to make a contribution at the highest levels of government. Of course. I mean, uh, Senator McKenzie paid a high price for, like, a, you know, for a breach. Uh, a, a breach that was identified to the ministerial standards, but of course there will be uh, hope. There, I mean, we look forward to the opportunity down the track for Senator McKenzie to uh, make a contribution in government again. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. What action has the Prime Minister taken in response to Senator Car Canavan's admission on Monday of his undisclosed membership of a club for which he approved a $20 million NAIF loan? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, I, as soon as the Prime Minister was informed um, in relation to this matter, he asked the Minister to update his declaration of private interests, as all ministers are required to do, and of course, uh, Senator Canavan has done that. In the case of Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility funding, the decisions are made by the NAIF. The Prime Minister uh, also asked for advice from the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet on the matter raised by Senator Canavan, but of course uh, Senator Canavan uh, has since uh, stepped down from the Cabinet for other reasons. Senator, order. Order. I'm gonna, can I call, I'd like to call Senator Hanson for her question. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. As stated on the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment website, it's estimated that 70 per cent of the edible seabu, seafood Australians consume is imported predominantly from Asia. The freefall in seafood exports has left the Australian fishing industry on its knees as the corona grips virus grips the world and China closes its ports and flights carrying Australian produce. Will the Morrison government invoke a halt to all foreign seafood imports to save the Queensland and Australian fishing industry at this critical time of need, or will you continue to favour overseas fishermen and help drive the final nail into the Australian seafood coffin? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Hanson for her question and, uh, and correspondence that, uh, that uh, she has had with the government uh, on this issue, including uh, discussions that, uh, that I've had uh, with her. The government is uh, acutely aware uh, of the impact the seafood industry, uh, the tourism industry, many other sectors of Australian industry are facing as a result, in particular, uh, of the downturn in visitation from Asian markets like China and Japan as a result of the coronavirus, as well as the downturn in economic activity uh, and hospitality activities in many of those markets. Uh, that's why we're working to make sure that we help those industries to, uh, to go get through this period uh, in terms of trying to activate greater tourism and travel within Australia through our Holiday Here This Year campaign, our investment in the domestic travel sector, as well as our work uh, to, uh, to make sure that we support them 
where they are businesses who are export oriented in the seafood sector uh, to look at alternative markets. And uh, Senator Dunningham and I uh, have, uh, have uh, both met with, held discussions with uh, members of the seafood industry and wrote uh, to the seafood industry yesterday, providing dedicated contact points uh, into Austrade. Uh, in relation to imports and exports of, uh, of Australian seafood and seafood into Australia, uh, there is a significant trade in both directions of seafood. But I would point out that in areas such as live fish, we export $29 million of seafood products and import $5 million. In crustaceans and mollusks, we export $1 billion but import $549 order. million. Senator Hanson, dollars. on a point of order. On a point of, <coughs> point of order, my question was directly to will the minister address the imports <coughs> oh, Senator, would, would the minister address the imports into Australia? I'm, I'm Senator not... Hanson, no, I, I, you're restating part of the question. It was a lengthy question, and with respect, the minister is being directly relevant to the terms of the question. Um, I, I ask senators where a minister may be strained. They, I give them some latitude. Uh, but you had a lengthy question. You're, you're restating part of it. I think the minister, with respect, is being directly relevant to the entire question asked. As I've said before, a minister can respond to all or part or any aspect of a question. Senator Birmingham. And, and Mr President, the last category I was going to highlight there, live fresh lobsters and crayfish, where Australia exports $739 million of such product but imports nothing at all. It will be important to the long-term viability of those sectors that we keep their export opportunities open, and that means maintaining the type of trade relations with other countries that enable us to do so. Supplementary question, Senator Hanson. Does the minister concede that the Morrison government's free trade agreements are prohibiting the protection of Queensland and Australia's seafood and fishing industry? Senator Birmingham. Uh, no, not at all, um, not at all, Mr. President. Uh, in fact, if I go back to that last figure that I cited, uh, Australia exports $739 million of live, fresh lobsters and crayfish, and we import none at all, none at all. Uh, so for that part of the seafood industry, it is essential that they have access uh, to other markets. Uh, yes, there's an Australian domestic market, uh, but the markets they have access to overseas uh, are far larger markets, more consumers willing to pay more, creating wealth, business and employment in Australia as a result of those export opportunities. And the same can be said in the live fish sector, around crustaceans and mollusks as well. The opportunities there are very real, and it is why it is important that we continue to create opportunities for those businesses uh, to be able to sell their goods, uh, creating maximum levels of Australian exports. And it's one of the reasons why, just today, data shows once again record levels of trade surplus for Australia as a result Order. in Senator part of Birmingham. our FTAs. Senator Hanson, final supplementary question. Minister, the fishing industry have told me personally that they are on their knees. Does the minister recognise the death of the Queensland and Australian fishing industry is imminent if Australia continues to be swamped by cheap seafood imports? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, no, I don't recognise that nor agree with that sentiment. Uh, the death of many parts of the Australian fishing industry would occur were we to uh, undertake policy decisions uh, that withdrew their capacity to be able to service their export markets. Uh, and in the end, these businesses need, for the long term, uh, to be able to get back into markets when those countries recover and continue to sell premium product at premium prices that enable Australian businesses to employ. Ultimately, our trade agreements are working in Australia's interests. Today's data shows the 2019 trade surplus for Australia, what Australia exported in excess of what we imported, stands at $67.6 billion. It's a record trade surplus for Australia. Uh, it comes <laughs> off the back of month after month after month of record trade surpluses, showing that our export industries are firmly doing the job for Australia and contributing very much to a healthy trade surplus driven in part Order. by Senator our free Birmingham. trade agreements. Time for the answers expired. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how Defence is supporting the whole of government effort to repatriate Australians from coronavirus affected areas overseas? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and also thank you very much uh, to Senator Henderson. Uh, for the question, but also for her ongoing support for defence and particularly for defence industry. Uh, yesterday I was very proud to outline to this chamber 
uh, the, all the work that the ADF are doing on uh, Operation Bushfire Assist, which is the largest mobilisation of the ADF domestically in our nation's history. I'm also very proud that the ADF has been able to very quickly mobilise and provide very significant support to the whole of government efforts on fighting and tackling the coronavirus. Uh, these efforts, as uh, Minister Cash has said, are being led by the Departments of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Health and also Home Affairs, but Defence are playing a very significant role in this response. And we are working across governments very well to ensure uh, the best interests of the Australians who have got caught up overseas, uh, particularly in Wuhan. The ADF currently has 236 personnel supporting the departure of Australians from Wuhan, and they're doing what they do best. They are providing a wide range of logistical support, and uh, those things, as I said yesterday, uh, the many things that can be measured by statistics and by quantities and numbers, but they are also providing that support that is not uh, directly measurable. That is providing uh, additional support and that helping hand and that spirit of kindness to the Australians and the families who are returning to Australia. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister expand on how defence is supporting home affairs with these efforts, particularly on Christmas Island? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you to Senator Henderson for the question. Uh, defence has directly supported Australian Border Force with the transfer of the first two groups of Australian evacuees from Learmonth to Christmas Island. And ADF uh, people are assisting the assisted departure of Australians from Wuhan, as I said, to Christmas Island. Um, 168 personnel are providing direct garrison support at Christmas Island and 49 at uh, Rathbath Learmont, which is uh, currently being dismantled and relocated to Darwin uh, due to an impending cyclone in the northwest region. Uh, there are 19 members who are coordinating uh, this effort also from ADF headquarters. And defence uh, support to home affairs include, includes the re-establishment and the operation of the facility at Christmas Island, including the provision of food and many other life essentials and comforts for those who are currently at Christmas Island. Uh, the garrison support is also very wide, everything from catering Order. through to Sorry. decontamination and transport. Senator Reynolds. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate what further support mm -hmm. Defence is prepared to provide? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, Senator Henderson, in close uh, consultation and collaboration with the other uh, if impacted uh, agencies across the federal government, Defence is very closely monitoring uh, the novel coronavirus situation with a focus now on contingency planning in support of these whole of government efforts. And in particular, we're currently focusing further on movements, additional movements of people and also the stores that might be required to be transported across the country uh, to support this. Uh, support is also still currently underway for the assisted departure of additional Australians, as has been previously reported on the Air New Zealand flight and, and any further possible Australian government uh, organised flights. In that sense, we're providing health, logistics and movement staff to ensure detailed planning and support of DFAT health and ABF should further requirements uh, be of defence. And can I just say in conclusion, can I thank all of the ADF staff who are so willingly doing uh, this Order. task at Senator the moment? Reynolds, they continue to serve with great distinction on our behalf. Has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. Over a billion animals have been killed by these climate fires over summer. As many as 25,000 koalas have been killed on Kangaroo Island alone, with thousands more under threat from the loss of habitat, starvation and thirst. Over 10 million hectares of bush, forest parks and bushland have been decimated. Over 80 per cent of the World Heritage listed Blue Mountains has been burnt. We have already been in the midst of an extinction crisis before these summer's fires. Ecologists warn that some species may never recover. The government has already said that their $50 million is not enough. When will the government front up and fund the recovery, the restoration and the protection that our environment desperately needs? When will the government announce the money that we need right now? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. 
Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Hanson Young, for part of a question, at least. Um, uh, Mr. President, these are serious issues, and uh, the government uh, has acted and acknowledged very much that the devastation caused by bushfires over the recent summer uh, is not isolated to the tragic loss of life, which this chamber acknowledged uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, nor is it uh, isolated to the loss of, uh, of property uh, or economic assets, but, uh, but very much does include uh, the loss of habitat, the harm to environment and to ecosystems. That is why uh, the Treasurer and Minister Lee announced an initial $50 million investment to support immediate work to protect wildlife and habitat recovery and acknowledge that this is a down payment for emergency interventions. In terms of further investment around other long-term aspects of recovery, the government has been very clear that whether it is in relation to infrastructure rebuild, uh, support for individuals, uh, support for businesses, uh, support for the tourism sector, support for the environment, investment in mental health services, all of which we have taken decisions to do in the wake of these bushfires, we have indicated in all of those cases that they are initial decisions and that we will then monitor the impacts across those sectors and respond further where necessary and appropriate. Immediately we have pursued, amongst that $50 million, funding to provide care for and rehabilitation of injured wildlife, uh, secure viable populations of threatened species, to control feral predators, other pests and noxious weeds that are a major threat to scientifically map and understand the true impact of these fires and to work with landowners around protecting the precious remaining unburned areas, allowing them to serve as arcs and to support our native plants and animals uh, to recover. There has been extensive engagement with the conservation sector in this Order. and there will Senator continue Birmingham. to be so. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Critical habitat for native wildlife has been destroyed, as um, previously outlined, but it may never recover. Will the government commit now to a moratorium on land clearing to protect the only habitat our wildlife and our precious koalas have left? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. thanks, thanks Mr. President. And, uh, uh, Senator Hanson Young seeks in that request a, a sweeping uh, policy decision, uh, asking that it be made uh, firmly on the run. The government has in place at a national level environmental laws that ensure that when it comes to land clearing decisions or other decisions, uh, the federal government has a say insofar as it relates to the defined matters of national environmental importance. Uh, and those matters take into consideration the requirements for habitat uh, for endangered and threatened species. Uh, those matters take into consideration scientific advice, uh, but it is not the government's intent or policy uh, for us to take over the responsibilities of states and territories when it comes to land management practices overall. Uh, the states and territories have clear responsibilities there. This parliament has determined a federal responsibility which we administer when it comes to those very particular Order matters of Senator national Birmingham. environmental Senator significance. Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. We know these fires are linked to climate change. We know climate change gets worse by burning fossil fuels. When will the government start protecting the koala from being killed by the coal industry and the loggers? That's right. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, we know that the Greens uh, like to emote a lot when it comes to uh, these issues and these questions. The government likes to deal in facts and to work our way carefully through, carefully through each of these policy matters. That's why, Mr. President, uh, we continue to make sure that, as a government, we deliver on our climate change targets, that we exceed those climate change targets, and our commitment is firmly to continue to seek to exceed those targets in the future. By exceeding the targets we've set, uh, that of course means Australia makes an additional contribution to what must, by necessity, as Senator Cormann has rightly outlined in answers already this week be a global effort in terms of emissions reduction policies into the future. Uh, but in addition to those emissions reduction policies, we have been very clear out of this summer the need to deal with adaptation and other factors which I have every confidence will also be considered comprehensively by any reviews that are part of the post bush Order, Senator season. Birmingham. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Cormann. Last year, the Prime Minister tabled the report by the Secretary of his Department 
in relation to former ministers Pine and Bishop. Why is the Prime Minister refusing to release his secretary's report into former Minister Mackenzie? Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, because in relation to serving ministers, uh, these are matters that are considered by the Governance Committee of Cabinet. So these are documents that are subject, they are part of the deliberative processes of Cabinet, uh, and as such, under the long-standing traditions, Order. under the lo long-standing Westminster conventions, uh, under government of both political persuasions, uh, obviously submissions that are informing the deliberative processes of Cabinet are not released. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. Does the Gations report confirm engagement between the Prime Minister or his office and former Minister Mackenzie or her office in relation to the corrupt sports fraud scheme? Uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, firstly, I completely reject the description uh, that uh, Senator Chisholm has attached to the sports grants program. The sports grants program uh, is a uh, successful, popular uh, program which has made a significant positive difference in communities right around Australia. Right around Australia, it was administered appropriately and consistent with uh, the guidelines. And if I can refer you to uh, 8.1 in the guidelines, it'll actually show you there that the guidelines themselves actually make very clear that there is uh, appropriately the opportunity for discretion and for, for for judgments to be made to deal with relevant issues. So, I mean, this proposition that somehow uh, that this has not been administered consistent with the uh, rules and guidelines is false, uh, and so I completely reject. I completely reject the proposition. Now, in relation to the other part of the question, I refer Senator uh, Chisholm to my primary uh, answer. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. In response to the corrupt sports rot scheme, Minister Chester has said that, and I quote, there's a need to give the public confidence in the transparency of these grants are applied. The greatest deficit we have in Australian politics has nothing to do with the budget. It's a deficit between us and the people we represent. Instead of hiding Mr Gation's report, why doesn't the Prime Minister listen to Minister Chester? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, we always uh, listen to Minister Chester, of course. Uh, uh, always, always. And, and let me say that Mr Chester would agree uh, that the sports grants program is a, a very popular, highly successful program that was very effectively administered consistent with the guidelines. Uh, and, and, I would, and I would also I would refer you uh, to the publicly released guidelines, which clearly stated uh, that discre discretion uh, could be exercised and obviously that the minister would be the final decision maker. And uh, I'm quoting, while delivery of funding will be on a competitive basis, if after completing, completing the assessment process emerging issues have been identified and or there are priorities that have not been met, other projects may be considered to address these emerging issues or other forms of financial arrangements with applicants to otherwise further the objectives of the program. So, I mean, that, is, that goes to the crux of it. I mean, it was very obvious in the guidelines. I mean, you know, there's a whole series of considerations. I mean, firstly, of course, clearly, uh, Senator McKenzie was concerned that Labor electorates were not were underrepresented in the recommendations of Sports Australia, which clearly Senator McKenzie thought was inappropriate. Order. You've got to make Senator sure there's Cormann. an appropriate uh, geographic Time spread. for the answer has expired. <laughs> Senator Hughes. Mm -mm. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting those affected by the bushfires? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank Senator Van for his question, uh, and particularly on such an important topic as the ongoing uh, assistance that the Australian government is providing to people who have been devastated over the summer by the terrifying bushfires that have affected so many states around this country. We all know that these fires have been um, absolutely devastating and the magnitude of them has been unprecedented in terms of the crisis that it has delivered for Australia. The government of which I'm a member is absolutely committed to doing whatever it can to help families, to help businesses, to help communities, so that they can get back on their feet as quickly as possible. And that is why this government took the immediate action to set up the National Bushfire Recovery Agency and funded it with a $2, million, $2 billion recovery fund to make sure that we coordinated the recovery so that the people on the ground could rebuild their communities and get on with their lives. We believe that there are tens of thousands of people who have been impacted by these terrible bushfires. And some of the initiatives that have been put in place 
including making sure that there is a one-off $1,000 disaster recovery payment for every adult that was affected. And initially, $400 was made available for every child, but that was increased to $800, particularly in fo to focus on the fact that many of these fires were, uh, had occurred and people had lost their homes uh, in the lead-up to the children returning to school. What we wanted to do was to make sure that we could put cash in the hands of people who were affected. Um, and we took this decision um, by making sure that, uh, that the Centrelink mobilised its services so that they were actually located within the regions that were impacted, whether that be through their mobile service units that, that, uh, that drove around the bushfire-affected community so people could, uh, could actually access it in their home area, or the many, many people that were actually the service teams that were mobilised into these communities. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Van, a supplementary <coughs> question. Minister, what support is the government providing? Uh, what immediate support is the government providing to these families and communities? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Van. Um, there have been a myriad of different ways that the community, and particularly individuals, have been supported through uh, through the uh, the assistance of this government in response to the the devastating fires. There are a couple of initiatives, uh, particularly in my area um, of uh, families and social services, including the increase in the amount of emergency relief funding that was available within these regions. An additional $40 million was made available in January. Uh, and what we've done is we've sought to use existing providers who are currently on the ground in the areas, in the bushfire-affected areas, so that we could make sure that we could get the money and the assistance to these people as quickly as, as we could. Uh, and I particularly wanted to thank uh, St Vincent's, uh, Salvos and Anglicare, who have been primarily the ones who have been able to get these services out onto the ground very, very quickly. And we also made sure that we used them because locally based response and a locally based and locally driven recovery to these bushfires is absolutely essential for rebuilding our regional Order. communities. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the government helping to rebuild these communities and ensure resilience over the longer term? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, most particularly, uh, the, the, most, uh, the most obvious thing that has, has emerged as the, we've moved into the recovery phase of these bushfires is the long-term nature of the support that's going to be required to many of these communities to enable them to build, rebuild, and particularly to make sure that when we do rebuild, we rebuild better. As part of that is making sure that independent advice is available to people so that they can make the right decisions as they're making decisions about what they do into their future. And that's why we made an additional $10 million available to financial counselling services. So when people are faced with the financial decisions that they need to make as they rebuild their lives, they'll be able to have that independent advice and be able to, to speak to people to make sure that they're making the right decisions for them and their families. Particularly, we wanted to make sure that the National uh, Debt Recovery Helpline uh, was also had increased funding, so that people, through in the comfort of their own homes, were able to make a call and get that advice uh, in person. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Kitching. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In preparing his report for the Prime Minister in relation to the application of the Statement of Ministerial Standards to former Minister Mackenzie's conduct of the Community Sport Infrastructure Program, I ask, did Mr Gagens interview the Prime Minister or any other minister to inform the preparation of his report? And if yes, who? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, um, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I, I'm not aware, obviously, of the processes that Mr Gagens uh, uh, has followed. Uh, I will. You do know. You do know that you are. You do know that you are talking, of course, about a document uh, that was prepared to inform the deliberative processes of a cabinet uh, subcommittee. But nevertheless, uh, in order, out of an abundance of helpfulness, uh, let me take on notice uh, whether there is anything I can helpfully provide uh, to Senator Kitchen uh, to to assist her uh, in relation to this. I should also say um, that while the uh, report that uh, Mr. Geitchens has prepared uh, is uh, subject to cabinet confidentiality. The secretary of the department of uh, prime minister and cabinet uh, has indicated to the prime minister that he does intend to make a statement over coming days setting out his findings and the basis for them. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Did Mr. Gagens interview any of the prime minister's staff to inform the preparation of his report and in particular was the Prime Minister's sports and infrastructure adviser interviewed? 
Senator Cormann. Um, uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think that Senator Kitchen now is uh, you know, obviously uh, getting a little bit confused in relation to what was actually referred uh, to Mr. Geitchens uh, for him to consider. Obviously, uh, obviously uh, there was the specific issue in relation to the, in relation to the conflict of the, at the time, suspected conflict of interest, uh, which uh, you know, needed to be assessed against the uh, requirements and the type of ministerial uh, standards. And Mr. Geitchen says, of course, uh, reported uh, in relation to that. But again, uh, in an abundance of helpfulness, because we are very helpful, open and transparent government. So I will see whether on notice I can provide you with some further information. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. I thank Senator Cormann for his helpfulness. Um, in her statement to the Senate last night, former Minister Mackenzie belatedly advised of further undeclared memberships held during her time as minister. Were these further undeclared memberships declared to Mr Gagens? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I will take that question on notice. Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for, De for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is addressing the serious issue of suicide in the serving and veterans' defence personnel community? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank uh, Senator Macdonald for her question. And I also would like to acknowledge and thank her for the work that she does in Queensland to support veterans and veterans' employment and also their mental health. So thank you, Senator. I know that everybody in this chamber is deeply concerned about the scourge of suicide, the 3,000 deaths every year in Australia, and the particularly high rate of suicide amongst our veterans and also our serving personnel. So, and I know we all share the goal to do whatever we can to stop these tragedies, to safeguard the mental health and well-being of our veterans and our service personnel, and that this is an issue we all agree is an issue of national and lasting importance. As we all know in this place, it is an issue of uh, a profoundly complex issue that deserves a comprehensive response. Uh, over the break, as the Prime Minister has said, we listen very carefully to uh, everybody who has an interest in this issue, and we listen to the voice of veterans and also their families. And we came to the conclusion that we wanted to do more than just hold a royal commission which is why yesterday we announced a broad range of measures uh, to assist greatly in this area. And there are three in particular that I want to mention now. First is the establishment of a national and a permanent uh, rolling commission into veteran suicide and its preventions, which will have all of the powers of a royal commission. Second, to initiate an immediate and comprehensive independent review and analysis of more than 400 suicide deaths in the defence and ex-services community since 2001. And thirdly, to establish a veterans family advocate who will offer a new and crucial bridge for families which will put their voices and their interests at the heart of policy making and also decision making. And I'd just like uh, to thank the opposition in particular for their bipartisan approach to the introduction of these measures and uh, to all others in this chamber who shares our commitment, all of our commitment to this Order. issue. Order. Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline in more detail the intended role and powers of the National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, um, Mr President, and also Senator Macdonald for that question. Uh, the National Commissioner will be established uh, with the following criteria. It will be established as an independent and a permanent body. It will be accountable to the parliament. It will have the same powers of a royal commission. And that means they will be able to, whoever the commissioner will be, will be able to compel the production of evidence and summon witnesses. They will also be able to identify and investigate systematic issues that will inform government policy on suicide prevention and also mental health and well-being. The commissioner will investigate individual cases of ADS and veteran suicide, working with every state and territory coroner. And more immediately, the commissioner will commence with an independent review of historical veteran suicide cases, focusing on the impact on their of their military service. Families can choose to engage if they wish, and if they Order, do, Senator they will Reynolds. be provided all support. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. 
Can the minister advise the Senate of the intended role of the veterans' family advocate? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. This is one of, I think, the most important initiatives uh, that we've announced as part of this package. In addition to having a veterans advocate, we will now have a veterans family advocate who will have a crucial role of directly engaging with family members uh, in any which way, uh, you know, in any which family circumstance that veterans and ADF members have. They will also be able to advocate to help shape policy and the administrations of veterans' benefits and also support, particularly from the lens of a family member. The advocate will, as you would expect, focus on mental health and suicide prevention and will also be expected to contribute to our understanding of the risk factors relating to the well-being of our veterans and their families and particularly so during as what we know is a high risk area through their transition from the ADF uh, into civilian society. The advocate will sit within the veteran affairs portfolio through, through the existing Order. repatriation. Senator Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. What role did the Minister for Finance's office play in the design and implementation of the Community Sport Infrastructure Program? The Minister for Finance, uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Well, in relation to implementation, none. Uh, obviously, um, neither me nor my office had visibility. I'm taking there's two parts of the question. If I might answer the question, Senator Wong. Uh, I mean, Order. So, in relation to implementation, taking that first, I had no visibility in relation to uh, obviously the specific decisions in relation to specific uh, projects. That was entirely a matter for the responsible minister, as is appropriate. Uh, in relation to the um, in relation to the program itself, it went through the normal uh, deliberative processes of cabinet. It went to ERC. It was put forward as a, a policy proposal by the relevant uh, minister, and it would have gone through the normal process. Uh, that I'm, I'm obviously a member of the Expenditure Review Committee, uh, and uh, hence, uh, you know, I participated in that process, uh, making, you know, in relation to that budget measure in the usual way. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Independent Auditor General's report noted that Sports Australia, Sport Australia, is not subject to the Commonwealth Grant rules and guidelines. Was it the Minister's office's advice that the Community Sport Infrastructure Program be administered in this way? And did the Minister's office provide this advice because Sport Australia is not subject to the Commonwealth Grant <coughs> rules and guidelines? Senator Corbyn. Uh, no, the answer to that is no. I mean, that is essentially the way the PGPI Act works. Uh, as the PGPI Act that was actually put forth, put together by the Labor Party, by the Labor Party. Uh, and 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 so uh, so in relation in relation to this in relation to these matters, uh, as as was also very clear in the explanatory memorandum to the uh, PGPI uh, bill at the time, uh, you will find that it made very clear that it was not intended order. to capture. Order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. I'm sure that the two of us are both very interested in a discussion about the GBB, PGPA Act, but that's not the question. The question that Senator Gallagher went to. Uh, was whether or not the program was designed in this way in order to avoid the application of the guidelines no, on the advice of the minister's office. If you could just answer that question. Well, on the point of order? No. I just oh, can I just rule on the point of order? I'm sure there are many people interested in the act, I, for oh, one. Um, my, 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 my point, I, I think with respect, there were two questions there. Um, one asked about a fact, one asked about a, a motive. Of the, on, on the behalf of the minister, and I think the minister is being directly relevant to the question in the answer he is giving. The answer to the question that uh, Senator Wong just raised, no, there was no specific advice given uh, in relation to circumvent, uh, you know, as you suggested it. Uh, essentially, this worked in the usual way. The usual practice, the usual, the usual legal, the usual legal arrangement is consistent with the PGPI Act, uh, as put together by the Labor Party, that corporate entities were not covered by the Commonwealth uh, grants uh, rules and guidelines. But as you, as you know, recommendation for the Auditor General's report suggests that that is changed. Uh, and uh, the government has accepted that recommendation and will be acting on it. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Has the minister or any current or former staff members ever seen a spreadsheet listing funding applications under the Community Sport Infrastructure Program colour-coded and focusing on applications from marginal electorates held by the coalition as well as electorates to be targeted by the coalition? Senator Corbyn. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I, I have not seen any such spreadsheet other than what has been 
other, other than what has been published uh, you know, in the media in recent times. Uh, I would also, I would, I would, I would say that I cannot speak for all former uh, staff members. I mean, I don't know what all former staff members uh, currently are involved in. So I think, I think that you're asking me to provide an impossible warranty, and I won't do that. I won't do that. Like my, my staff, my office, neither me nor my office were involved in the uh, decision making uh, in relation to those projects. Well, I mean, there's actually, there's actually nothing unusual in relation to this. Order. Minister McKenzie was the responsible minister administering that program. I mean, what the, uh, that is entirely appropriate. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. My, my question is to the minister representing the Minister Order. for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please update the Senate on the government's assistance that's been provided by Services Australia to the bushfire impacted communities across Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank Senator Antic for his question and also his, uh, his interest and his support that he has provided to South Australian communities who have been so devastated by the bushfires. I know he's been out there building fences with Blaze Aid. Uh, along with many of our other colleagues, so I acknowledge that support. Um, but particularly, I want to acknowledge the extraordinary hardship of the people of New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, and Victoria, who have been impacted by these devastating events of the last few months. And particularly, we need to commend our first responders who worked absolutely tirelessly. First of all, to save people's lives and protect their properties, but then to assist them as the recovery has started. And to that end, Services Australia have been out on the ground on the fire front from the minute after the fires were put out to make sure that they were providing assistance to people who had been impacted by these fires. Um, the department has, uh, has also made sure that they have been very present, um, not just on, um, on the ground, but making sure that they have manned their telephone lines so that when people made calls to try and find out what assistance they were able to immediately receive so that they could deal with the immediacy of losing their homes or not being able to get back to their homes, um, that the disaster payments hotline was being answered in uh, in extraordinarily short time, a matter of seconds for each call, so that when people rang up they did not have to wait. And in addition, um, in fact, since 16th, the 16th of September last year, over 130,000 calls have been answered in an average waiting time of less than 90 seconds. So particularly I want to acknowledge the staff that have been in the walk-in centres, the staff that have been on the end of the phones, and making sure that they are there to listen to people and assist people when they are obviously in a time of great need. And also to commend the Australian Defence Force and acknowledge the role uh, of Minister Reynolds uh, in making sure that they got the boots out in the ground to make sure that we could provide comfort to those Order, people impacted. Senator Rustin. Senator Antic, a supplementary <coughs> question. Thank you, Mr President. Given the scale of the recent bushfires, how has Services Australia adapted to assist affected Australians on the ground to ensure immediate and effective support? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Antic. Um, the ability for us to be as efficient as possible in getting disaster relief payments out on the ground was absolutely a priority of the mobilisation of Services, SA, uh, of Services Australia uh, when the fires and the disasters hit. Uh, but I'd just like to update the Chamber and let them know that from mid-September 2019 until February 2020, I can advise that over 75,000 claims uh, for the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment have been granted with over $89 million made available for people affected by the fires. Over 300 claims uh, for disaster recovery allowance have been granted, uh, and over $14 million has been paid in additional payments for children in respect to the 35,000-plus children who have been in the affected areas, as well as the mobile service centres that have been out on the ground, the ADF. Uh, these teams remain in place to continue to assist people who have been impacted by the fires. Senator Antic, a final <coughs> supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How can Australians who still need assistance and live in fire-affected regions get help from Services Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. There are a number of ways in which people can get assistance from the government, but the first and easiest way uh, for those that are in uh, areas that have been declared disasters uh, for the purposes of the Australian Government Disaster Relief Payments um, is to ring the hotline. And that number is 1802266. Uh, and people who ring that number, as long as they have uh, the evidence that they need, uh, will get paid almost immediately. In fact, we have seen heard of stories where people have put the phone down and checked their bank account and the money is already in their account. 
But in addition to that, Services Australia are making sure that they have a range of services available to people, including mental health support services, financial counselling services, making sure that they can deal with people who are in short-term distress and making sure that children and their families are able to be helped through the immediate trauma of the crisis and making sure that they're in the best position to be able to get on with rebuilding their lives. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Cormann to the questions asked by Labor senators. Thank you. Well, what an extraordinary performance we saw from the government leader in the Senate, Senator Cormann, and from Minister Colbert in, that, in the chamber today. Uh, it's obvious that they have learnt none of the lessons over the last couple of months and understood none of the concerns of the Australian people. When you think of the defence of Senator Cormann, uh, there he is saying that uh, Senator Mackenzie did nothing wrong in terms of her administration of the program. Well, that's clearly not the view of the Australian people. And we saw the performance of Senator Colbeck here today as well. Uh, you've got to remember that this is the minister responsible for actually cleaning up this mess. Anyone watching his performance today would be scratching their head to think that this is the person who is supposed to be responsible for cleaning this up. Um, clearly, he was out of his depth in answering the questions that were put to him today about when he first became aware of this, but also did he receive any legal advice that he clearly dodged. Uh, the, que the question uh, from Senator Wong that went to the heart of that. So uh, it is obvious the defence the government is trying to run where they're trying to give platitudes to Senator McKenzie to say that you'll be back, you'll be back. It was only a technicality, uh, but we know what really went on here. And the most damning statistics that I've seen uh, in, relation to this uh, in relation to this sports rot actually go to the three rounds of funding. Uh, and what we saw in those three rounds, there was December 2018, uh, February 2019 and April 2019. Uh, at the December 2018 round one, uh, 41 per cent of the approved projects were not on the list of endorsed by Sports Australia Board. So that's 41 per cent uh, in December 2018. In February 2019, in round two, uh, 70 per cent of the approved projects were not on the list of applications for Sport Australia planned to recommend. So, as you can see, as you're getting closer to the election, as they were becoming more and more desperate, the political interference in the projects that were approved through this process went off the charts and the percentages became higher. And then the last round, just a month before the election uh, in 2000, April 2019, it went up to 73 per cent of the approved projects had not been recommended by Sports Australia. So that just goes to show you uh, how deliberate this was, how much it was focused on marginal seats and how much it was designed to give the government the best possible chance of winning the election. So for them to try and sit in here and say Senator McKenzie only had to resign because of a technicality, well, the Australian people deserve so much better than that. And they are absolutely concerned about the way that this fund was administered. And I'd say to the government, Put your, put, your shoe, put your feet in the shoes of those parents, those volunteers, uh, those people who give up their time to put the, forward these proposals and the hard work that they put in, because they're the ones who have been dotted by this. And that's the Australians that I identify with. I've got young kids, um, they're getting involved in sport. I see how much of that uh, grassroots community sports is actually led by volunteers. They're the ones who actually are the lifeblood of these communities, and these are the people that this government has dotted through their corrupt sports rorts program. So this is something that the Labor opposition will absolutely hold them to account on. And just because Senator Mackenzie has become the scapegoat, the government will be held to account on this. Uh, they haven't released what was in the Gations report. Um, that obviously goes to some of the substance of Senator Mackenzie, but they haven't gone anywhere near justifying the decision making that they have made. And I think it's interesting that uh, in the question that I've put around the quote from Minister Chester, he's actually showing a bit of contrition in terms of the way this uh, scheme operated. We saw a similar quote from Senator Littleproud yesterday as well, and that I think that those members in uh, rural and regional Australia understand some of these issues better than they do here in the Senate. And they understand that uh, communities being dotted has a significant impact in that part of the world. So, I think that that shows you that there is 
a division within the government, however, how this is handled, and it's really important that we continue to put a focus on this and highlight these divisions. I just wanted to finish on the defence that the Prime Minister has often used about this was all about providing uh, facilities so that kids didn't have to get changed out the back. Well, that has been blown out of the water by the fact that there were 12 applications for uh, change rooms for kids and girls that were rejected. So he can absolutely give up that now. Uh, it shows you that that is a nonsense defence from the Prime Minister. Uh, this was a deliberate program. Uh, they were absolutely determined to get the best political outcomes out of this. Uh, it shows you by the fact that the percentages that they increased by as they got closer to the election to disregard Sports Australia that they were in this up to their necks. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Here in Australia right now, we have three, at least three, very serious issues that are confronting us: the, the bushfires, the drought, and of course, the coronavirus. Uh, these are matters that are consuming the hearts and minds of the public, and these are the issues that this government has an undivided focus on. We've established, a, we're establishing a two billion dollar national bushfire recovery fund. We're spending $8 billion in drought relief, and we're acting swiftly in response to the Chief Medical Officer's advice on dealing with the coronavirus and promptly ensuring that we can mitigate the risk to the economy as best as we possibly can. I mean, these are issues that are critical, that are front and centre in the minds of the Australian public. Yet all Labor have done this entire week, this entire week in their questions is to stoop to their usual cynical, grubby lows of muckraking, of spear, smear and innuendo. But we shouldn't be that surprised, because this is, frankly, Labor's modus operandi. We, however, deal with the facts, and the facts are that, that, that Labor are deliberately overlooking for their own political advantage is that Minister Mackenzie's oversight meant more funding went to Labor areas that than would otherwise have been the case. As the ANAO points out, electorates held by the Australian Labor Party represented 35 per cent of approved projects and 34 per cent of approved funding. These electorates would have been less successful had Sports Australia assessments team recommended them, uh, that, that would have been recommended would have been maintained. They recommended 26 per cent of projects and 26 per cent of funding. Yet, by uh, Minister Mackenzie's intervention, it was in fact lifted, lifted to 34 and 35 per cent, respectively. Uh, there are many Labor frontbenchers who actually welcomed the announcements when these funding uh, was delivered. In fact, the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Albanese, even went so far as to thank uh, Minister Mackenzie uh, for her support for the Dawn Fraser pool in his electorate. I mean, 35 per cent of funding projects went into Labor-held seats. Yet in my home state of Western Australia, Labor ran a program called Local uh, Projects, Local Jobs, a $35 million McGowan, commitment, McGowan government commitment that went into 97 per cent Labor-held seats. 97 per cent Labor-held seats. Premier Mark McGowan defended the spending, saying every single one of our election commitments went through he said a rigorous evaluation process, but community groups did not apply for grants. Instead, projects were nominated by Labor MPs and candidates and signed off by a committee of Labor campaign chiefs and senior front benches in the party's leadership team. This proves that the evaluation and selection was purely a political process. Yet, as I said before, Minister Mackenzie's intervention ensured that, in fact, even more projects went into Labor-held seats. Yet, Labor, back on the other side of the country, where I'm from, from the great state of Western Australia, uh, they, they borrow from a book that just says we're going to put uh, into pretty much 100 per cent. I mean, 97 per cent is practically all of their seats. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, candidates and MPs over there had to explain to the committee why the funding was necessary, but also how they planned to best exploit the commitment in political campaigning, including plan for 
local media. I mean, talk about politically motivated uh, you know, funding. Uh, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And Labor on this side, those on that side of the chamber, want to uh, lecture us about how projects can be delivered. I mean, this, these, this program has gone into supporting some wonderful projects, 684 projects across Australia. 684 projects uh, investing $100 million into very important community sport and infrastructure. Uh, we've seen firsthand the positive impacts that this program has been delivering for so many grassroots sporting organisations and local communities around the country. The program is supporting the construction of new community infrastructure and upgrading so many more sporting facilities to help support local jobs. Of course the demand for these projects is always going to be strong, it's always going to be high, and this government, because of our strong economy, our record, we are able to deliver, able to deliver in projects like this and we hope can continue into the future. Thank you. Um, Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. I, uh, I also rise to take note uh, of answers given by Ministers Colbeck and Cormann in relation to questions asked about the sports rorts affair by Labor senators. There are two images, really, that will rest in Australians' minds over the course of January. One of a sullen, indifferent Prime Minister lounging in a luxury resort in Hawaii while Australian suburbs and country towns burnt to the ground. The second is of this flagrant abuse of taxpayers' money uh, for narrow political gain by a government that has lost its way, surprised to win an election, lost its way within months of winning the election. No ethics, no principle, no guts, only prepared to back self-interest. It's all about, with this lot, the interests of the Liberal and National Party not the national interest. It's certainly not uh, for those members of the Nationals who can't wait to get on a plane and get home this week. It's certainly not about the interest of country communities. In this an big anniversary year for the National Party, uh, it should be a source of shame to that once great political party what's happened this week. Doug Anthony and Jack McEwen wouldn't even bother to roll over in their graves. Uh, if they had cause to reflect on what happened here. That may well be true. But, the, but, but what a shallow bunch of opportunists, former coastal real estate agents and Country Life magazine spivs this once great political party has become. Over and over again, the National Party promises that they'll stick up for the bush. And then they fly to Canberra and they sell out country communities. This time, they sold them out to the Prime Minister's office and to Liberal campaign officials. The terrible irony of the sports rort scandal is that so many of the communities that needed those grants most were the ones that the Nationals pretend to represent. The small towns where a local team means something more than a weekend activity, where the local pool is a respite from a long, hot summer, where volunteering for your kids' netball team helps overcome the isolation of rural life. Senator Mackenzie has rightfully resigned because of a conflict of interest. She hasn't resigned on account of her real crime, her stewardship of this industrial-scale $100 million rort. Her resignation late last week is like Hannibal Lecter apologising for eating with his mouth open. Her colleagues over there, nationals and liberals, continue to defend her because they don't think that she's done anything wrong. Systematic abuse of taxpayer funds for political gain is what they do. It's core business. It's the reason they are here. It's their business model. It's government by cardboard novelty check. They are interested in only one thing—their own careers, not the jobs of ordinary Australians, their own survival, not decent community volunteer-run sporting clubs. And that's why when the parliament paused for a day earlier this week to reflect upon the tragedy of the bushfires, to pay respects to people who had died uh, in country communities, the National Party could do only one thing, squabble over political leadership. This bloke, Barnaby Joyce, the member for New England, the constituency that I used to live in, 
I mean, God help us all if the member for New England becomes the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, but the current bloke couldn't lead a dog to a butcher's shop. Senator Mackenzie may have resigned, but one of the architects of this rot, the, Senator, the Senator's former Chief of Staff, Jonathan Hawkes, has got a brand new job. After all of this, he was appointed as Federal Director of the Liberal Party. I believe this is his first week in the new job. That's what happens in the National Party. Organised, uh, uh, politically focused misallocation of public money is rewarded by the big jobs. And now he's in charge of the National Party organisation right round the country. This rort was written and authorised by the Prime Minister. I actually think Senator Mackenzie will tell all in due course. So she should. Sacking her for sports rorts is like Robbie Waterhouse being called to account for the fine cotton affair and sacking the horse. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and for the record, Doug Anthony wouldn't be rolling over in his grave because he's not yet dead. So um, <laughs> he's a. Uh, but I, I um, thank uh, Senator Ayres for recognising that the Nationals are turning 100 this year and that we are a great party um, and acknowledging that our priorities in the National Party are for rural and regional Australians. I also uh, just put on the record that, uh, contrary to what Senator Ayres said, I don't leave my regional uh, base and fly to Canberra. I drive to Canberra so I can witness on the ground exactly what is going on out there. I don't get to Canberra and forget what is happening in my regional community or forget what is happening in regional communities across Australia, um, and particularly uh, this year, having witnessed the devastation of the bushfires across the entire eastern part of my state. Uh, I don't forget that uh, when I come to Canberra, and I don't believe any of the members in this chamber come to Canberra and forget about what's going on at home. Just like I don't believe that I have heard from the Labor Party which of the 684 successful applications under this community grants program should not have been funded. They are all community sports programs. Many of the applications of the over 2,050 applications came from Labor electorates with letters of support from their Labor ministers uh, and Labor representatives. This is delivering grant programs is not a rort. Delivering grant programs and getting the money out there to community grants programs is not pork barrelling. It is doing our job. When we said we wanted community level sports to be supported, when we started this program with $30 million and realised how successful and how popular it was, so we expanded the program to make it a $100 million program, we were able to fund 684 applications across the country, giving a spread of sports, a geographic spread, and a spread across all electorates, regardless of whether they were held by coalition MPs, Labor MPs, whether they were marginal, whether they were safe seats, it didn't matter. The priority was to get funding out there into the community, big and small community clubs. And I, I, Senator Ayres is right. We are defending Senator Mackenzie and how she handled this because we don't think that her getting money out the door and into community clubs has done anything wrong. 684 successful applications that got money, many of which were welcomed by, by their ALP uh, members. Certainly, um, Anthony Albanese himself thanked Senator Mackenzie for funding the Dawn Fraser pool in his electorate. So, 
for, for Labor to now sit there in their electorates, having taken the money for projects in their electorates, having taken the money, ha having said thank you very much, Senator McKenzie, we'll take that money, but now we're going to complain about how you handled the, the program. It is hip hypocritical, absolutely hypocritical. And to say that a minister doesn't have discretion of funding and expenditure is, is absolutely crazy. On the one hand, we get absolutely lambasted if we listen to bureaucratic advice. For example, when Senator Birmingham uh, was, was health minister and the bureaucrat said, stop funding Healthy Harold, he overrode it because the, the backlash was incredible. That's what ministers do. Ministers look at the advice, they evaluate the advice, and then they make a decision because they are elected to do that. That is what elected representatives Senator Davey, are for. Senator your time has expired. And just Thank remind you. you in future to please refer to those in their other place by their correct titles. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I also rise to take note of questions by Labor senators today. And I feel for my senators on the other side who have had to come in here and defend this rort this afternoon. I feel for you, Senator Davey, who has just spoken before me. But Senator Davey just told us that in this whole sports rort scandal, in the administration of these grants, it didn't matter if the recipients were in Labor, National, Liberal seats. But the point is it did matter. That's what the Auditor-General found. That's why we're here. That's what we're discussing. If it didn't matter, if it wasn't relevant to the decision-making process, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be asking questions about it. We wouldn't have a Senate inquiry on it. The fact is it did matter to the decision-making process, and that's the problem. That's not acceptable. That is not acceptable. So that's why we've been asking questions. But sometimes I wonder why do we bother? Because when we have such disrespect from senators like Senator Colbeck today, who has asked serious questions about the legality of this administration of this program, he barely answered. One of them he didn't answer, and the other ones he barely answered. I mean, he, he tried quickly, not like that other time where we waited for a minute 20 or whatever to get the first word out, but he barely answered the question. And it's a serious question. And then, following Senator Farrell's further questions, he just sidestepped. He tried to pin it all on Senator McKenzie. Pin it all on her, nothing to do with me or Senator McKenzie. But you can't all do that. You can't all sidestep it. You can't just dump this on Senator McKenzie and walk away. Because we know it goes further than her. It goes further than Senator McKenzie. It goes straight to the top straight to the top. The poor old Senator Mackenzie taking all the blame. All the blame. But we won't let all of you sidestep it. It took the Prime Minister more than two weeks to work out what was evident to Australians from the very start. There was a breach of the ministerial standards. But he is still, and you are all still, refusing to address the elephant in the room. That there was a breach in integrity in the administration of this grants program. That is what the Auditor General found. They are the facts. They are the facts. This government treated a $100 million program like a checkbook. A checkbook rolled out with the sole intent of getting the government re-elected, of winning marginal and target seats. So yes, Labor seats, target seats, marginal and target seats. We know this. It is clear in the report. And after all of this, Senator Cormann has then stood in this place, defended Minister Mackenzie, and said she has done an outstanding job as the Minister for Sport. We'll tell that to local sporting clubs in South Australia, who spent hours and hours and hours on their grant application. Enormous effort by volunteers who thought that when they had a go and put their application in, they would get a go and it would be treated fairly. Who believe the government, when they open a round of applications like this, that they have their best interests at heart, that they care about sporting infrastructure in local communities. So they take the time 
in the late hours of the evening, through weekends, tirelessly working on applications, they don't necessarily expect to win, but they expect a shot at winning. They don't expect to be struck off because of the location of their club, because they don't happen to be in a marginal or target seat. They expect you to show them the basic respect of reading their application and treating it fairly. It's a pretty reasonable request from Australians. It's a pretty reasonable request. Integrity in government, integrity in the administration of a grant program. And not only can you not give it to them, you can't clean it up properly either. You can't act swiftly to deal with the people responsible. You can't take responsibility for your failure of those clubs, for your failure of those communities, your failure of the people who wrote those applications and expected a fair go, and the failure of the kids in those clubs who had a highly rated application and missed out because of where they lived. Well, they can't all live in your marginal and target seats. They can't. But they should be able to expect that you treat them fairly. They should expect a fair go. This isn't about the clubs who won. It's about the ones who deserved to win and lost, who were robbed because of your Thank motivations. Thank you, Senator Smith. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the uh, answers to the questions I asked uh, Senator Birmingham, who is representing the Minister for Environment in this place. I asked, of course, uh, Madam Deputy President, about the significant devastation, the absolute environmental catastrophe that has been uh, inflicted on Australia's environment as a result of these terrible bushfires over summer. Now, we know that these fires have been unprecedented. We've seen the loss and devastation to communities. And here in this place, only earlier this week, we paid condolence to the loss of lives, the loss of homes and the suffering of communities. But there has also been great suffering by Australia's wildlife and our nature. Over one billion animals have been killed as a result of these climate fires. Thousands and thousands of Australia's iconic koalas, dead, burnt, thousands and thousands more injured, starving now because of the lack of food and clean water. Over 10 million hectares of Australia's bushland and forests devastated. Over 80 per cent of the World Heritage Area in the Blue Mountains has been burnt to a crisp. Our environment has suffered a huge blow as a result of these climate fuelled fires that we've seen over summer. And we know it's going to take years and years, decades, uh, to rebuild, repair and protect properly. The government's announced $50 million, and they keep saying that this is a down payment, yet they're refusing to say how much more is coming and when. And of course, we, we're all a bit cynical about how much the government is really going to put into this recovery, this restoration of environment and future protection, because this government has year after year cut and slashed the budget of Australia's environment. They've gutted their own environment department. They've gutted environmental protection programs. They've refused to fund the programs that were put in place to protect what was already a growing list over a thousand animals and species that were endangered. These climate fires have made this crisis now worse than ever. And the government can't continue to keep saying $50 million is on the table and that's enough. I mean, Celeste Barber actually raised more money in response to these climate fires than this government is prepared to put into protecting our wildlife and our native areas. I mean, if a comedian can raise more money, it just puts in stark contrast 
the commitment that this government has. And of course, we know that critical habitat, particularly for Australia's iconic animals like the koala, have been decimated. And many, many Australians, in fact, millions of people right around the world have been watching what has happened and have been grieving for the loss of wildlife and Australia's environment. And they look at what's been going on here. They've been seeing these burnt koalas and they want to know what it is that this government is going to do to protect them. Well, the biggest threat now to Australia's iconic species of koalas is that the very limited habitat they still have is not protected properly. We've got people wanting to get into those areas and clear their land destroy the trees that these koalas live in. What we're asking the government today to do is to guarantee that they will step up and protect <coughs> the very limited homes and habitat that these koalas have left. Fund the environmental protection and restoration properly, but step in to say we know our wildlife, our koalas, our rock wallabies, they've already suffered so much we're going to make sure that from now on their habitat is properly protected. That's what I asked the minister today, and that's what this government is failing to act on. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I declare that.